ARS and Cheap Trick. Now that seems like a pretty interesting billing there. <laughs> it was interesting. I have a, a story that I can share to kind of- Please do. Touch on that a little bit. Uh, I think the first show we did was in Tokyo. And they had vans that uh, took the bands from the hotel to the, the show. And all the bands were full for ARS. So I had to ride with Cheap Trick. And, you know, they asked me who I was, and I was telling them that I was Ronnie's brother, and uh, they were kind of making fun of the Atlanta rhythm section because uh, they call that Quaalude music. <laughs> hey, y'all, this is Chris Hicks, and welcome to the Southern Rock Insider. If you like what you see, please hit subscribe and click the notification bell. It's time to rock Southern style. The Southern Rock Insider. Welcome to the Southern Rock Insider. Thanks, sir. Glad to be here. We got here Steve Hammond with us today uh, from the Macon area here, a singer and a great singer and a good friend of mine. We're going to talk to him about some of his musical experiences and things he's done through the years around here. And uh, first thing I want to touch base on is the Old Mogus String Band. And uh, a great band it was with Tim Brooks, Chip Vandiver, Stanley, Killingsworth. Uh, who we got Terry Corbett on the bass and Corbett Ken Wynn. Ken Wynn on the guitar, Steve Myers on keyboards. Steve Myers, yeah. uh, a great band that had dual lead singers with you and Greg Brooks. I don't think I've ever seen a band that has double lead singers where they're not singing at the same time. Yeah. Maybe Earth, Wind and Fire. That'd be the only other one I can think of, really, you know. <laughs> but it was similar to that. You kind of had your songs you sang and Greg had his. That's right. Tell me a little bit about how, how you and the Old Mogey String Band got together with, with uh, Greg and Tim Brooks and those guys. How did that come to be? Well, uh, it was just kind of like old friends getting together on the music scene back then and uh, just decided to, to get together and make a band and do some demos and just uh, having fun, you know? Well, I think we got together in the mid 70s and uh, we had a couple of demos, uh, Don't You Know, and That's Just Making. Mm -hmm. I think Chip, Chip Vandiver wrote those two songs, and I think we did the uh, demos in a studio here in Macon somewhere, and we actually uh, went to Studio One in Atlanta to redo those two demos, and they had just switched from a 16-track system to 24, so when we got there to do the demos, the uh, new machine was out of sync, so we never got to do that. But that's too bad. Yeah, I mean, the tapes that I have of it is from pretty sure Ken Wynn's mom and dad's garage. Absolutely, it and, was, and uh, was a still practice. a great recording considering you know what it could have possibly been recorded on back then. But it, the music still comes through; it really does. And I'd like to say go to YouTube, but I just got on YouTube and checked it, and there's no old muggy <laughs> string stuff on there yet. Okay, but we'll see if we can change that. And, uh, that sounds good. I'd like to hear it. Yeah, I would too. I'd like for people to hear it. Maybe you and I will have to re redo a couple of those tunes. That's great. We'll and uh, put them out for the public or yeah. something like that. I, I think the public should hear them. So, uh, Steve, let's talk about after the Old Moldy String Band uh, broke up, or I guess what you want to say it, uh, what other projects did you get involved with? Uh, Chris, I actually uh, played with a group called Cisco. And we did so. Uh, we went on the road uh, for several months maybe up to about a year. And uh, after that, I just kind of decided I want, wanted to, you know, kind of get out of the music scene and, and start a career. Uh, I know some other stuff that you did through the years. Uh, being brother of Ronnie Hammond from ARS, a lot of people don't know this, that you sang a lot of harmonies on the records. Is that right? Uh, sing harmony on a few records and on some live shows. Okay. What which songs do you remember singing harmony on on records? I think the first one would, would be on the Dog Days album, a song called Cuban Crisis. And I think probably the last was Boys from Doorville. Mm -hmm. um, I, a song called I Ain't Much and Silver Eagle. Well, I bet that went well because you and Ronnie's voices are so similar. It'd almost be like overdubbing, you know, to sing harmony. I'm sure that's probably yeah. why y'all did that, you know. Uh, it was an interesting experience. I bet. I bet <laughs> it was. ARS being a, a great studio band, being a studio band before they became a live act, that's why they're so tight, you know, why the music seems yeah. so precise. Absolutely. Right on it. Yeah. And 
thanks to Dean Daughtery and Barry Bailey, J.R. Cobb, and uh, Robert Nix. Who am I leaving now? Paul Goddard. Paul Goddard. There you Girl. go. Sorry about that, Paul. <laughs> Things usually won't get left out. <laughs> right. This sound was cool. <laughs> did, did you and Ronnie have bands together? Were you in bands before the Atlanta Rhythm Section got going? What was those days like? No, uh, you know, Ronnie started as a teenager uh, very early on and he played in several different bands. And uh, I actually never got into the music scene until probably the early 70s. You know, Ronnie had uh, cut an album back up against the wall and I guess that kind of sparked my interest uh, a little bit, trying to see, you know, what kind of things I could accomplish with music. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as far as uh, Tim and Greg and all those guys, uh, we just happened to be friends at the time and we got together and just wanted to have fun and make some music. We've talked about Tim Brooks on the show before, but what a guitar player. I mean, oh, for amazing. people that didn't get the chance to see him, which unfortunately is most of you out there in, in the <laughs> world, uh, a real treat if you want to hear somebody that was truly a musical genius and, uh, and just a really unique player. Tim Brooks is, is really something. He was a large personality, a large man, and a large personality, a great talent. Yeah. Can you give us a few uh, Ronnie Hammond stories without getting too illegal? <laughs> uh, let's see here. I guess the, the most legal story I could probably give you is uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I was actually working with the band and we were on the road and uh, we were back at the hotel after the show. And uh, we were just talking and having a good time. And he said, Steve, uh, one day we can look back at this when we have grandchildren and uh, think about all these good times we've had together. And sure enough, uh, that rings true today. I have a granddaughter, so it's good memories to look back on and share with some of those folks in the family. Yeah. Ronnie was, was beloved by everybody. I think everybody I ever met that knew him really liked him. You know, he was a, a sweetheart of a guy. He was a great to go. Yes, he did. <laughs> Even they, I was talk, talking with the Stillwater guys about uh, their career and stuff, and, and Ronnie is in the same category there. Is, is, he's from here. You know, a lot of people that came through Capricorn, they said they were from Macon, Georgia, because the record company was here, and they moved here. Yeah. But when Ronnie got in the scene and, and Stillwater too, these are our people. These people from South Georgia, right here, South Macon, excuse me. And uh, this is not somebody that came to Macon and signed. This is people that are actually our hometown boys. And, and Absolutely. I, I think everybody felt that way about Ronnie. When he broke in the scene with So Into You, uh, I remember Jimbo turning me on to this song and saying, that's my uncle singing that. And, yeah. and uh, just, just a good feeling to know somebody from your hometown has done good. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the ARS early days okay. and, and how Ronnie got into the band. How did that happen? Okay, uh, Ronnie, uh, in high school, he played with a band called the Celtics. And uh, he graduated in, I think, 1969. And he moved to Atlanta. And he got a job working at Lefebvre Sound Studios. Uh, Lefebvre had a, a big outfit in Atlanta, a big public. That being Madeline Lefebvre? Uh, well, his dad, okay. actually, okay. owned the studio and everything. So that's where he uh, actually met uh, the members of the Atlanta, the studio musicians that formed, to form the Atlanta Rhythm Section, and uh, Buddy Bowie. So, you know, uh, in Latin Rhythm Station had a lead singer before Ronnie. They had one album before Ronnie came along and he decided that uh, he wanted to try something different. So that's where Ronnie got his opportunity to uh, showcase his vocals and uh, they all loved him. So that was the start for Ronnie. It was a magical combination. I've heard the album with Rodney Justo singing right. first and, and there's nothing wrong with it now, but Ronnie's voice just really, you seem like they really gelled with him. I and, think they did. And uh, you know, I remember uh, many years ago now when we opened up for the Atlanta Rhythm Section on New Year's Eve. And that was shortly after Ronnie had came back. He had left for a while. Right. And uh, boy, it was like ARS is here again. I mean, the guy sounded great. The band always sounded good, but with him singing with him again, it just had that sound, you know. Yeah. And uh, 
yeah. uh, a fixture. He was in the band for probably 20 years, I guess, uh, something like that. Yeah. And then he left for a few years and helped raise his son, Jesse. That's right. And I had a good time doing that and then, and, and then came back in the band in the late 80s, I think it was, maybe 89. Yeah. And uh, I know Ronnie was awful proud of being from Macon. Years later, we'd, we'd tour with him sometimes with the Outlaws, we'd play with Round Road Section. And, We'd have a few drinks, of course, and get to talking about things. And being from Macon was a big thing to us all. I think anybody that's from Macon knows what I'm talking about. We're kind of proud to uh, be where we're from and have all the stuff that happened around here happen and be part of that whole scene was, was kind of cool. Macon has a great music history. Yes, it does. A very rich sure musical does. history. It sure does. And in a lot of different ways, from the R&B to the rock and roll to singer-songwriters, all kind of great talent comes through. You being one of them. Oh, and uh, the world hasn't heard Steve Hammond like they're going to yet. But <laughs> they've heard some of they didn't know about on ARS records, but that's all right. <laughs> We're going to get him to you. Give us one more good memory from, from your ARS touring days. Something really stands yes, out. Yes, absolutely. I would say probably 1979, the Atlanta Rhythm Section went on tour in Japan. It's called the Japan Tour. And they uh, toured with Cheap Trick. So, uh, I got to experience all of that for about two weeks. We did shows, live shows, in different cities in Japan, and that was just a phenomenal experience. I'll never forget that. That was really special. Packed audiences, I'm sure. Packed. Man, uh, ARS and Cheap Trick. Now, that seems like a pretty interesting billing there. <laughs> it was interesting. I have a, a story that I can share to kind of Please do. touch on that a little bit. Uh, I think the first show we did was in Tokyo. And they had vans that uh, took the bands from the hotel to the, the show. And all the bands were full for ARS, so I had to ride the cheap trick. And, you know, they asked me who I was, and I was telling them that I was Ronnie's brother, and uh, they were kind of making fun of the Atlanta Rhythm section because uh, they call that quaalude music. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting comparison. Uh, you know, Cheap Trick in Atlanta Rhythm Section is totally different type of music. So it was it's funny how bands fun. like that get, get on tour. and it's, a, it's funny how they put people together. Stillwater was talking about the same thing, and I've experienced that too. People you would never think would be together. Sometimes yeah. it works, and sometimes it, it don't. Yeah. I know that uh, before I joined the Outlaws many years ago, I saw them here making opening up for Kiss. I thought that was a pretty interesting combination. <laughs> Undoubtedly, that happened quite a few times. Yeah. But, uh, but Ronnie had talked about doing a, a solo career in the country music industry. It never really happened, but uh, J.R. Cobb, he was a guitar player for the Atlanta Rhythm Section. He wrote the song, uh, Rock Bottom, and Atlanta Rhythm Section did a demo of that song. And lo and behold, it was a big hit for one owner. Wow, many really years later, later, huh? How about yeah. that? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about how me and you got together. Yeah, let's do and, that. Uh, from my memory, I, I knew you a little bit. I don't know if we'd ever actually met, but I knew who you were from the old Modi String Band recordings and all. But the way I remember uh, getting to know you was, was at Ronnie's funeral. I saw you standing up there, and they were playing uh, Will I Live On When I Die. And I made eye contact with you, and I just thought, man, what a lonely place that must be to be standing up there. And, I remember talking to you afterwards and, and uh, giving you my number and saying, hey, let, let's get together, which I'm really glad that you did. And uh, we started working on some music and just, just uh, being friends and, and uh, sharing some music and some life together. And uh, it's been a real treat to have you, I'll tell you Thank that. Chris, I remember uh, back when, when I first knew who you were, before we had actually met and before this time you just described, uh, that I was very familiar with, you know, the Chris Hicks band and everything that you were doing. And you were really, you really had it going on back then and uh, still have it going on today. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we do. We, we do a tribute to Ronnie when, when we play with uh, Steve doing three or four tunes. And we, we try our best to really sound like ARS for those songs because they deserve that. And having Steve sing them gives you a real view of what that band sounded like live because I mean this in a good way because him and Ronnie sound so much alike, really. We, we try to capitalize on that rather than play it down. Uh, he's not trying to sound that way, this is how he sounds. And brothers generally do sound quite alike. And uh, it's a real treat for the public. I know uh, people tell me all the time how much they enjoy it. I can't wait for us to get back to it. 
and and uh, get out and play live some for people. Thank you, Chris. I'm really excited about it. Me too. Thank you. Steve, thanks for coming down and talking with us today here at Capricorn in the Crow's Nest of Capricorn Studio, worldwide headquarters of the Southern Rock Insider. And uh, Steve Hammond with us today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Chris. And we'll see you next time. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching this episode of Southern Rock Insider. Please hit subscribe and click the notification bell so you won't miss a single episode. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please respond below or you can email us at southernrockinsider at gmail.com. This is your Southern Rock Insider, Chris Hicks, and thanks again for watching. The Southern Rock Insider.